In this micro talk, I will focus on Hugo Ball's sound poetry. He called it Poems of Sounds or Poems Without Words. I will focus too in the cabaret, Voltaire, and the first Dadaism. Europe, at the beginning, in the first quarter of the 20th century, saw extreme events. The Russian Revolution in 1916, the failed German Revolution in 1917, the First World War. It was a period of rapid changes, the age of the machine, and very important scientific and technological developments. Our conceptions of the universe changed through the theories of Einstein and also the way to understand consciousness through the theories of Sigmund Freud. Art was not immune to these profound shifts. The artistic avant-gardes were both a result and a reflection of these important changes. And among these avant-gardes was Dada. It roughly can be said that Dada began in 1916 and lived for a short period of time until the beginning of the 1920s. But Dada, as the epitome of anti-art rebellion, had a huge and lasting impact that reaches to the present. Dada challenged established notions of art, challenged the idea of art for art's sake, and they sought to establish links between art and life, between artistic innovation and social and political change. Provocation was very important for Dada, and in words of Tristan Zara, polemic was always a big part of Dada. Hugo Ball and Emmy Hennings crossed the border from Germany with fake passports in 1915. They went to Zurich, that was a city away from the war, a home to artists, pacifists, bohemians and revolutionaries. After 10 difficult months as penniless artists surviving working in vaudeville, Hugo Ball and Emmy Hennings set up the Cabaret Voltaire. They very soon were joined by other artists and the Cabaret Voltaire became the hub and the laboratory for the avant-garde. It was a place for poetic experimentation and for the mixing of the arts, dance, music, poetry, masks, choreography. An important part of their events it was provocation and enraging the audiences. It had pictures on the walls of Hans Arp, Giacometti and Picasso. There were recitations by the symbolists, expressionists and futurists. And there is where Tristan Sara recited his first simultaneous poems, helped by Hanko and Richard Husselbank. Simultaneous poems, they were read several texts at the same time, often in different languages. The board was collision, collage. It was impossible to understand what they say but as Hugo Ball explained, the important thing it was to hear the human voice. There were also Brutist poems shouted out, accompanied by drum beats. There were also African-inspired dances and chants. And there is where Hugo Ball recited his first phonetic poems. This Zurich Dada period didn't end when the cabaret Voltaire closed in July 1916. There were more activities at Dada Gallery, a manifesto, and a publication, a Dada magazine edited by Tristan Sara from 1917 to the 1919. And now I'm gonna perform one of Hugo Ball's most emblematic poems that he performed 
in the cabaret Voltaire. Caravan. Olifanto bambla, o fali bambla, grossiga mi pla fra bla horem, e giga goramen, i goblo e corusula uhu, o yaka o yala, an logro bum. Blago bum, blago bum, bosso fa taca, u, 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 u. Escampa bula busa o lobo, ech tata gorem, es chigue zumbada, bulu busu budu ulu subudu. Tumba baum, kusaga uma baum. Hugo Ball's phonetic poetry doesn't come from nowhere. Prior to going to Zurich, Hugo Ball participated of the German avant-garde. He knew artists like Paul Klee, Oskar Kokosa, and Wassily Kandinsky. He was familiar with notions like the using of the subconscious to stimulate creativity, and he also knew of Wassily Kandinsky disposition to abstract art. He was aware of the Russian Cubo futurists experimentation with language and he also knew of isolated sound poems from the past, like the poems of Christian Morgenstern that he recited in the cabaret Voltaire. Ball was critical of language, a language that sustained a set of values that brought Europe to war and carnage. He said that language of power and jingoism was ravaged by journalism. He wanted to escape from the representational function of language. He said poetry should discard language in the same way that painting discarded the object. In June 1916, Hugo Ball performed his first phonetic poems in the cabaret Voltaire. And as he wrote in his diaries, Flight Out of Time, this performance was a cathartic event. He was wearing the iconic cylindric costume made of cardboard that Hanko himself created it was finding very difficult the performance, trying to hold his laughter, trying to breathe, to bring out the words with difficult movements. And then suddenly he found himself adopting the cadence of incantation, invocation. He saw himself like a little boy participating in a liturgical Catholic ceremony. This performance gives us a, a clue of some of the threads that run through Hugo Ball's performance. The fact that this performance ending ended to be like a invocatory chant shows us that Hugo Ball was very interested in ancient magical texts. He was very interested in mystical thinkers and he also talk about the returning to the alchemy of the world. Ball saw the modern artist like a kind of Gnostic priest. There was another thread, and that is the influence by Wassily Kandinsky. Kandinsky said that language had not only the aim of representing objects, but also to reflect inner sounds. The function of the poet was to manipulate these inner sounds to allow other meanings to emerge that he called vibrations. And this pure sound is thought to exercise an impact in the audience's souls. What makes uh, Hugo Ball's phonetic poetry so unique, so distinct, 
is the fact that he invented words. There are no words that denote objects. They don't have a representational function. But somehow, they are not completely abstract either. These invented words, they were conceived as reminders of other words. He says that they touch lightly in concepts and ideas without naming them. To summarize, to understand Hugo Wolf's phonetic poetry, we have to understand it like a conjunction of three threads. On the one hand was his rejection of language, the language of power and patriotism that brought Europe to war and carnage. The other thread is his interest in mysticism and his interest in ancient magic books. And on the other, the third thread is his, the influence by Wassily Kandinsky in his idea of the inner sound. He also discarded words, language, and wanted to construct an abstract poetry. But that poetry and these words that he created, they were not completely abstract, as they still somehow remind us of language, of a deep idea of language. Even if it's a magical, ancient, a mystical language.